What's up fellow reefers, today I wanted to show you how I'm going to make a recirculating CO2 scrubber with these parts here. I have a scrubber on right now that I've been using um, for my skimmer, it works great. I can keep my pH high, which makes the corals grow quicker and calcify quicker. Definitely makes my alkalinity and calcium consumption skyrocket relative to if I don't CO2 scrub. Now, if you recirculate it, the CO2 media will last longer. The idea is, right now, I'm actually drawing air through tiny little holes in this bottle. But really, you could think of it, if this was out of the bottle, air is coming in through this tube. I have a whole other video on why I pull the air from that bottle. It just makes it humid, which makes it work better. But uh, even if I were to take this off, so if you look at it now, you can actually hear it. Air is coming in through that port, goes through the media, goes into my skimmer, and then the bubbles come up through the skimmer, and then they are released from these tiny little holes that you probably can't see at the top of the lid. They look just like this lid here. There are little holes that release the air. Now, that air that's coming out has been scrubbed of CO2. So if I were to capture all that air and I were to feed it back through the system, it has to scrub less CO2, which is gonna make the media last longer. Another reason why the media will last longer is it's much more efficient in a recirculating system, so I won't have to have it running all the time. I'm going to install this solenoid valve to allow fresh air in when I don't need it running, so since it's running less, the media will last longer. And there's going to be a lot of people out there that want to make a CO2 recirculating scrubber, and they have a reef octopus skimmer. So I'm going to show you how to do that step by step. You are going to need these parts all from Home Depot, and you'll see why in a minute. There's more than one way to build this, but for me, this was the easiest way, and I think you'll understand why later. You're going to want some 3 8 inner diameter tubing. You're also going to want this guy. This is very important. You'll see why in a little bit, but it has a 5 16 outer diameter, which is very unique. Got this at Home Depot. I'm going to be connecting this guy. I'm going to have two chambers, but you could do it with one. You don't have to have two. If you do have the big CO2 uh, scrubber from BRS, this fitting, which will come in handy, is just a PVC reducer from one inch to half inch. And you can see these will screw into there. They're a half inch reduced to three eighths with barb fitting for this hose here. Now this solenoid, I'll put all the links to everything in this in the description, is off Amazon. It was $25, so pretty cost effective. The cord next to it, I'm gonna use to connect power to the solenoid. And you'll see how I set this all up. And yeah, I just figured, even if you're not using a reef octopus, this should come in handy. The reason reef octopus is those, those holes, there's two things we're gonna use. One is this is gonna draw air from it. That's why you need that special fitting. And there's another thing that you can buy off Amazon, links in the description here, that basically has these guys right here that are gonna plug up those holes, making it so air doesn't escape. Now, I have a uh, neck cleaner reef octopus. They're the same size holes, it's just a different lid you put on there and then it has a neck cleaner that cleans it. And then I'm also going to drain my skin mate through the port into an extra reservoir for a couple reasons. A big reason is you don't want this to overflow and feed into your CO2 scrubber if you're recirculating. And to me, that is the ultimate design to where hopefully I won't have to maintain my protein skimmer for months and I only have to change out the CO2 media every so often and I'll get a little alert on my phone letting me know the media is done and it's time to change it out and I can keep my pH stable at whatever I want it to be. Pretty sure I'm gonna do 8.3, but I'll do a little bit more research and see if there's any benefits of doing like 8.35 or something like that. So I'm just gonna get started building this and then I'm gonna show you how I took all these parts and made it all work. But hopefully this works on my first try and uh, you know how it is though, reefing ain't easy. I probably forgot a part, something won't work. If you have a reef octopus, protein skimmer and you're gonna set it up the same way. Everything you see here was purchased from Home Depot except for the solenoid, the rubber gaskets that are gonna block the airflow on the lid, the CO2 scrubber itself that I got from BRS, and these little fittings right here that I also got from BRS. Like I said though, everything's in the description. I'll have a shopping list for you. You can just buy these parts and hopefully that'll save you a ton of time designing and figuring out exactly how you're gonna hook this up. All right, so I'm gonna get started. All right, so the first step is going to be sealing up your lid to your skimmer. 
Now, the skimmer lid, for the Reef Octopus at least, has this little uh, groove here. That's fine, you put it on there and you'll realize, hey, that isn't like perfectly airtight. It's good enough for a recirculating CO2 skimmer. It doesn't have to be a completely tight seal. I would even argue you don't want that in case pressure did build up. You want air to be able to escape if it needs to escape. But this is gonna be more than enough sealed if you do these steps. So if you have this hole for the float switch to kill your protein skimmer if the cup gets full, definitely use that and that'll seal up this hole. If you lost it or for some reason or another don't wanna use it, the thing I told you to get on Amazon has some different fittings and you can use that to seal up the hole. You're gonna to have to use a screwdriver to pop it in there, just like I'm showing with these little guys. They don't just fit easily, but um, I'll show you how I did it on my lid. I actually purchased an automatic neck cleaner lid, so that's why I have the spare one here. Now, it's really important that you get this exact tubing, this exact tubing that has a 5 16 OD, which stands for outer diameter. The reason being is watch this. This doesn't even like fit in, but if you push, it's literally the exact size of that hole. And that to me is a plenty of seal. Now you might want to do one extra step for a couple reasons. You might be under your sump, hitting this, moving it around, and maybe it does come out. Because I have some skim ink gunk in there, it really does create a good seal on this. However, on the automatic neck cleaner that was brand new that I bought, it does able to move around a little bit. But again, with the rubber garments that I told you to get on Amazon, you can use this one right here. And I'll show you a trick. You put your line through, and then on the back end, you're gonna use this guy and you're gonna put it on there just like this. Now you can see when I pull on this, it gets to the rubber gasket and I mean, it does not wanna come out. The rubber gasket also helps keep it sealed. But now when you're working on your sump, when you hit this line and pull on it, it's gonna stay there and it's not gonna accidentally um, come out. It also helps keep it up at the very top. You don't want this way down into your skimmer to where it's gonna be collecting skim mate. So you could even put another one on this side if you really wanna be make sure that it's good. Now. We're gonna be using a 3 8 tube for the CO2 scrubber, which is a lot larger tube than this guy. You can see this guy actually fits in it. So you're gonna have restricted airflow by using one of these tubes into this tube. It's just not as much air can be at the inlet as the outlet. So a fix to that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use two tubes. We're gonna put them through two of those holes. Then we're gonna use a brass compression fitting that's in the links in the description we're gonna connect the two nipple fittings that goes into a big T, and that T is wide open, so it's not restricting the flow. So you have two air lines coming up that merge into one that goes into a 3 8 tube that doesn't restrict the airflow. When I put my lid on in this configuration and I have these holes sealed, I can feel the air being pushed and coming out of these tubes. If you put your ear next to it, you'll hear it blowing air out of your skimmer. That's why I told you to get these exact things because it works great on this Reef Octopus lid. Now, you don't have to use rubber garments. You could just seal this with something like silicone. And if you have a different kind of skimmer, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. I would definitely recommend, if possible, drill into the top of your lid. Don't drill into the side of the skimmer. The higher up, the better, because you don't want that skim mate going into the CO2 scrubber, you need to have something to prevent that from happening, whether it's a float switch or like what I'm doing is having a separate reservoir that is going to fill up with skim mate and I'm gonna have a float switch in that reservoir to let me know when that's filled so there's just no way that skim mate could ever be sucked up into this air intake lines. If you don't have a reef octopus lid, I like to do things so I don't have to actually modify it or change it. So if I ever wanna go back and I don't want a CO2 scrubber anymore, my lid isn't like permanently damaged or modified. But if you don't have a Reef Octopus and you decided to drill into it, you could just start with a 3 8 and you don't have to make this piece here. All right, the next step is these four fittings here, which is just a T and then three pieces that are barb fittings that screw into the T. The two on the horizontal part of the T are for the smaller 5 16 tubing that comes from the lid of your skimmer and the one that goes in the bottom is the 3 8 
for the regular size tubing for the CO2 scrubbers that come with them when you buy them. Uh, 3 8 is your normal fitting. All right, for liability disclaimer reasons, I am not a certified electrician. This is not professional advice. I am not telling you to do this. But what I did was take a cord that I got at Home Depot. I cut it, I stripped out some wire. The solenoid comes with bare wires. I connected them with some twist wire connectors as you can see here. That's how you make the solenoid so that you can plug it in. And I did plug it into my apex so I could turn it off and on at will. This is not waterproof. It should not be near water. You need to set this up in a way that there is absolutely no way whatsoever that this can be submerged or fall into the water. So don't put it above your sump. You know, even if it's fastened with nails and zip ties to where if for some reason it fell off, it would go into the water. You need this away. And if there is a flood or something overflows, you need to make sure that this is, there's no way it's gonna get wet. Um, you can buy one that is uh, waterproof. It's just gonna cost you a lot more. So this is hooked up and if I blow, oh, nothing. Now, when I plug this in, you'll hear it. You hear that noise? That's it opening up the valve. Now watch. Now I'll unplug it. Right when I unplug it, it stops it. So it is a little bit loud, it's totally fine. It's made to take 110 volts. You know, full disclaimer, do this at your own risk and definitely don't let it near any uh, water. I totally do not accept any liability for showing you guys how to do this, but uh, that's how this works. I just wanted to show you mainly that, you know, you can expect a pretty loud click when it turns on. So it's obviously best to Install this in a way that uh, there's no way it could ever fall in your tank. So if you even had it away from any water or your sump would be best. But you can see I took this uh, fishing line here. It's a 25 pound fishing line. And I'm wrapping a few strands around and tying a knot um, around this area so that can be held by it. And I'm actually mounting this with screws on the back side of this up here out of the way so you can't see it. Now, if it were to fall, it should fall down and not into the sump. But I'm also going to secure it with screws, these lines here, so I have a backup, just in case for some crazy reason it comes dislodged with the screws, it would fall and this would keep it from going into the sump in a way. The big scrubber from BRS, I actually got this used from a buddy, so I'm not 100% sure what it comes with, but I'm pretty sure one side will be similar to this where you can connect a 3 8 tube in, but the other side is left open. So all you need is the two parts, the reducer PVC threaded from one inch to half inch, then the 3 8 barb that on the other side is a half inch threaded screw in. And then you definitely don't need two CO2 scrubber uh, canisters. I have them, so I'm gonna use them because the less often I have to change media, the better. So if I have 10 and I had the room for it, I'd connect them all, but most people, if you just have one, that'll be fine. Now that you've got the tubes connected to the lid, you've put your solenoid together so you can plug it in, and you've created that T if necessary based on how you're configuring it. Really the rest of it is just cutting the lines to the lengths that you need to be able to hook everything together. There is one more part that I'll show you when connecting the solenoid and how you wanna do that, which the length of line does actually matter a little bit. But other than that, you can configure this and put these things wherever you want. I just did it this way because I want it underneath the sump, hidden so that no one sees it. So let's start at the very beginning, the lid. You can see I've got the uh, two lines coming out of the lid here and air is being drawn up there. The holes are sealed. You'll notice there's no skimmate in there because I am draining it out of this into a reservoir. I'm not sure if I'm gonna to continue to use this reservoir, but if you have the Reef Octopus with this guy right here, which is the float switch valve, um, you definitely wanna connect it in the reservoir. That way there's no way you could ever get skimmate going up into these tubes because when the reservoir is full, it's gonna kill your protein skimmer and turn it off. If you don't have a skimmer, where you can plug the float valve directly into the control box like the Reef Octopus. You wanna create some way to where if the skimmer, reservoir, or itself gets full, it will turn off the skimmer. Or you can take the risk, but you definitely don't want your um, skim mate overflowing and going into your media. You may have noticed that little silent noise, that, 
that's the solenoid turning off, just so you know what it sounds like. Here it is again, I'll play it a couple times so you can hear it. Skimmer, skimmer. So we've got air, the bubbles coming up, goes into the lid, and then it's forced out through these tubes, which I just kind of connected to the ceiling to get out of the way. Those tubes come into this T, go into this 3 8 tube here, and it enters my CO2 scrubber, goes through the media of the CO2 scrubber, comes out this side, goes around, comes into this CO2 scrubber, comes out this side, and then, and then this is the tube right here. It comes up into this Y right here. Now, let's forget about this for a second. It just goes around, right back into my skimmer, and then it repeats that loop a bunch. Now, this Y right here is actually a dead end. So you can see it connects to my solenoid, and as long as this is closed, then it's a dead end, so no air is being drawn from this. So you can just disregard this part right here and pretend it's not there and just think of it as one continuous loop. Now, the reason you put that there is with a recirculating CO2 screamer, it's very easy to raise your pH too high and get it to dangerous levels where it could hurt your tank. So you need to account for that and you have to have some kind of uh, pH monitor and controller to do so, such as the Apex. And here's two simple ways to keep your pH from going too high. You can program it to say, hey, when my pH gets to a certain point that I don't want it to go past, turn off the skimmer. That's one way to do it. Now the way that I'm doing it, because I want my skimmer to continuously run, is hey, instead of taking air through that loop that's getting passed through these CO2 scrubbers, let's just take room air. So that's what this Y is for. Now, when the pH gets to a certain amount, it's going to turn the solenoid on, allowing air. So now this Y has two openings. It has one here that I can draw air from and one here that I can draw air from. Now, to go through all of this tubing, all of these chambers, this T, all this stuff, there's a lot of resistance versus just going through this tiny little line here and then the solenoid valve, there's very little resistance. So you wanna make sure that this is a very short tubing. You could even connect this piece right here directly to the solenoid valve. It really just depends on where everything is and how you're setting it up. But you want this to be very short and you want very little resistance. There's the solenoid turning on. Now, is there some air being sucked here? Yeah, probably just a little bit, but it dra my pH drastically drops and it's, very minimal compared to what's going here. I wouldn't be worried about that. If you wanted to go over the top, you could add another solenoid and I'm sure you could figure out how to do that. But just to show you that you can hear when I connect this tube here. And then I put it next to my microphone. You can actually hear the air pretty drastically. So I wanted to demonstrate that for you so you can tell it's definitely sucking in a ton of fresh air. I would argue 95% is coming through this and not actually on the other path this Y takes just because of the resistance. All right, so that's my recirculating CO2 scrubber. You can tell condensation is building up in the lines. So there's plenty of humidity. You can see in the actual scrubber itself, there's condensation. So there's probably gonna be some maintenance. I'll make a follow-up video after I've gone through media two to three times so I can give you an update of how long it lasts and if there is some maintenance like do I need to drain the water out of the chambers because it built up too much or something like that. All right so now I'm going to show you how I programmed this solenoid in the apex to peg the pH wherever I want it and it is amazing how you can literally keep it right on the dot where you want it with this method. I think that's awesome. I know people will say don't chase numbers, but you don't have to chase anything. You can just peg it right to where you want it. Okay, so I installed this one day ago. And you can see on my pH used to fluctuate a lot. For the last day, the highest it's gotten to is 8.31 and the lowest is 8.29, averaging 8.3. To me, that's incredible that you can just keep your pH constant with this method. You could definitely open up the range from 8.25 to 8.35 or something like that. A big reason why I could see that that would be beneficial and something that I might consider 
is the solenoid valve does make noise when it turns on, which can be annoying if it's happening every 10 minutes or so. So if you had that big range, probably be like every one to five hours, something like that. Another alternative is you can get a quieter mechanism, like an electric ball valve that opens and closes. I'll put a link to that in the description. It's just gonna cost a little bit more. But let me just show you how to program the solenoid. So I actually have the fallback on off. And when there's no power going to the solenoid, it is closed, which means the pH will spike and raise out of control if something goes wrong. Now, because I think the solenoid could fail and it's turned on, but it never actually opens and the pH continues to raise, I'm not too worried about this one where I would put the safety is on the skimmer. So you can tell your skimmer, hey, if the pH gets over 8.4 or whatever you want it to be, turn it off and that'll be a safer way than relying on a solenoid valve. So this isn't too important, but I guess technically I should put the fall back to on so it doesn't make my pH go out of control. But like I said, I have that overriding it to where the skimmer is just gonna shut off. So let's go through what this is saying. It's saying if pH is greater than 8.3, then turn on the solenoid. When you give power to the solenoid, it opens it up. So when pH gets to 8.31, not 8.30 because that's not greater than, that's equal to. So when it's greater than, the valve will open by, because it gives it power. That's gonna let fresh air come in, the pH is gonna start dropping. Now, when the pH drops below 8.31, or when it gets to 8.3, it's going to kill the power, so when the pH gets below less than 8.31, it's gonna turn off the power and shut the valve, so now it's recirculating the CO2. Now you might be wondering, okay, so at 8.3, it's going to turn it off. Why is it jumping between 8.29 and 8.31? The 8.31 makes sense because of this line, but the reason that it actually does go all the way down to 8.29 is there is a little bit of a delay, so by the time the probe reads that it's gone down to 8.30, the pH is going to continue to drop before the recirculating CO2 air is actually going to have an effect and turn it around and make the pH start rising. So this is one way you can program it if you really want to dial it into a very specific number, and if you want it to fluctuate a little bit more, you could just program it to something like when pH is greater than 8.34, turn it on, and when the pH drops down below 8.26, then turn it back on, or maybe even 8.27, so that right when it gets to 8.25, it starts working again, brings it back up, and you kind of fluctuate in that higher pH. All right, so that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you found it helpful and you liked it, let me and YouTube know by liking, subscribing, or even comment. If you have some questions, comment, I'll answer them. And remember, reefing ain't easy. Appreciate you watching. See you next time.